Hello everyone, welcome to the Strat Lab. This is a brand new series on the channel where we are going to explore some math and engineering and learn how to apply it to KSP. If you're not a fan of this kind of content though, don't worry. I'll be releasing a music video in my more usual style soon. For our first episode, we are going to be building an Earth-Mars communication network with Realism Overhaul. Before we begin, let's define the goals for our communication network. For one, it needs to be able to provide coverage to all equatorial positions and orbits around Earth and Mars. And secondly, it needs to be as close to the planet as reasonably possible. This is because I want to use a compact CubeSat design, which works better if it is closer to the receiver. To fulfill these requirements, I'm going to set up a ring of eight satellites around Earth and a ring of six satellites around Mars. So before we can build this network though, we have three problems to solve. What is the lowest orbit I can put these satellites in so that they still can connect with each other? How do I evenly space the satellites in these orbits? And how much delta V does each satellite need? Now here's where we get to do some math. To make our lives easier, I want to find a general solution to this problem. In other words, I want a solution that will work for any number of satellites around any planet I may choose. Let's tackle the first part of the problem. What is the lowest orbit we can put n number of satellites in so that they all maintain line of sight with each other? To make this easier to understand, let's go through an example with four satellites. But keep in mind this will work for any number of satellites. The first thing to recognize is that the lowest possible orbit will be one where the lines of sight from the satellites just touch the surface of the planet. Any lower and the satellites will be cut off from one another. And hey, look at this! We have both an inscribed circle and a circumscribed circle here. The inscribed circle is of course Earth, which has a radius of 6,370 kilometers, which I will call R sub E. The circumscribed circle is the orbit of the satellites and has a radius of r sub o. Now as I said, we know that the radius of this inscribed circle is equal to the radius of the Earth, but we do not know the radius of the circumscribed circle. Fortunately, we could find this orbital radius with a little geometry and trig. Let's take a closer look at this section here. The most important things to recognize is that segment BA, which is equal to the radius of the Earth, is perpendicular to segment AC, which is equal to half the distance between the two closest satellites. Also note that the segment BC, which is equal to the orbital radius, bisects the angle theta here. These two facts come from the properties of an inscribed circle. And take a look. There is a right triangle here. That means we can apply the trigonometric definition sine of an angle equals opposite over hypotenuse. In this case, the angle is half of theta, and the opposite side is the radius of the Earth. If we solve for the radius of the orbit, we get this. Now, we know the radius of the Earth, but what is theta? This is actually the interior angle of the regular polygon created by the satellites and can be found with this formula, where n is the number of sides. We have four satellites, so this shape is a square, and n is equal to four. Plugging this in, we get an interior angle of 90 degrees. So plugging all these known values into the equation above, we find that orbital radius must be at least 9,009 kilometers. Since this orbit is circular, this orbital radius is actually equal to the semi-major axis. Keep this in mind for our upcoming calculations. Now, we know the altitude of our final circular orbit. However, how do we get the satellites to be evenly spaced in this orbit? To solve this problem, let's consider our final orbit here. To evenly space four satellites, let's imagine we have a stationary magic satellite cannon that will inject satellites into the orbit at regular intervals. You can see that if we set up this magic cannon to inject a satellite into orbit when the previous satellite completes three-fourths of an orbit, 
the new satellite will be 90 degrees ahead of the previous one. If we do this four times, we will end up with four evenly spaced satellites. Of course, in reality, we don't have this convenient magic cannon for inserting our satellites, but there is a way to achieve the same result. Let's say that instead of this cannon, we have an elliptical transfer orbit here in red. This transfer orbit is set up such that it intersects the final orbit at its apogee, which is exactly where our hypothetical magic cannon used to be. And the period of this transfer orbit will be three-fourths the period of the final orbit, which is the same as the interval for our magic cannon. You might see where I am going with this. If we place a satellite carrier onto this orbit and have it release a satellite into the final orbit every time it reaches apogee, we will have achieved the same result. We will have four satellites 90 degrees apart. All right, so we know the method. Now let's calculate the parameters of this transfer orbit so that we can actually use it. So as I said, the period of our initial transfer orbit will be 3 fourths that of the final orbit. We can calculate the orbital period of the final orbit using Kepler's law of periods. Here, a sub f is the semi-major axis of the orbit, and mu is the standard gravitational parameter of Earth. Inserting these values into Kepler's law of periods, we find an orbital period of 8,506 seconds, which is about two hours. From this, we can find that the period of the initial orbit is 6,340 seconds. Now we can actually use Kepler's law of periods again to find the semi-major axis of this orbit. Plugging in known values, we find the initial orbit has a semi-major axis of 7,406 kilometers. Now, in KSP, knowing the semi-major axis isn't all that useful. We'd like to know the perigee of the orbit so that we can actually set it up in-game. Fortunately, we can do some simple geometry to find this. The major axis of an ellipse is the longest distance between any two points on the ellipse, so it is this span here. And as you can see, the major axis is just equal to two times the semi-major axis. Also, the major axis is equal to the perigee plus the apogee. We know the semi-major axis and the apogee, so we can find the perigee. And we find a perigee of 5,803 kilometers. Hmm, but hold on here. We actually have a problem. This perigee is relative to the center of the planet, and it is actually less than the radius of the Earth. So our transfer orbit will actually go through the planet. And clearly that is not a good thing. But it turns out we can fix this by increasing the period to be 7 eighths times the period of the final orbit, rather than 3 fourths. Doing this nicely puts the perigee above the atmosphere, but it means we have to wait two orbits in between releasing satellites. As I'm sure you will agree, waiting a bit longer is preferable to having your satellites burn up in the atmosphere. We now know the final orbital radius and the perigee of our transfer orbit. That means there is just one problem left. What is the delta V needed for each satellite to transition from the transfer orbit into its final circular orbit? To solve this, we can use the concept of energy conservation. If you've taken a physics class before, you have probably seen the classic example of energy conservation in a pendulum system. At its peak, the pendulum has only potential energy. At the lowest point in its arc, it has converted all of its potential energy to kinetic energy. However, the total energy has remained the same. This means that if you know the total energy of the pendulum, and you know the height of the bob, you can solve for kinetic energy and find the velocity of the pendulum. Turns out, you can do something very similar with orbits too. The vis-viva equation tells us that the total energy of the orbit is equal to minus mu over twice the semi-major axis. And of course, this value is equal to the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. Here, the potential energy is equal to minus mu over r, where r is the distance from the center of the planet to the satellite, and kinetic energy is equal to v squared over 2. You'll notice that there is no mass term in this equation, 
And that is because the mass term actually cancels out on both sides. And which, of course, makes sense. A heavier satellite is not going to be in a different orbit than a lighter one, if given the same velocity. So, let's rearrange this equation to solve for velocity, and there we go! We know the semi-major axis of both the final and initial orbits, and we know what distance these two orbits intersect. We can now plug in known values to find the velocity of the final orbit, and the velocity of the initial orbit. And finally, by finding the difference between these two values, we could find the change in velocity, or delta V, is 319 meters per second. So re recall what I said at the beginning. This is actually a general solution and will work for any number of satellites. Let's recap the process quickly here. First, you find the altitude of the final orbit using the radius of the planet and the interior angle of the regular polygon created by the satellite's line of sights. Then, you find the periapsis of the transfer orbit using Kepler's laws and the geometry of an ellipse. If the periapsis is less than the radius of the planet, simply increase the number of orbits, this n sub o term, until it is safely above the atmosphere. And finally, use the vis viva equation to find the delta v needed to transfer from the initial orbit to the final orbit. As I said at the start of the video, I want to create a ring of eight satellites around Earth and six satellites around Mars. With this process, I found the parameters of these orbits here. Well, now that the math is done, let's apply it to KSP, shall we? To set up the network, I built this craft here. It consists of a Mars transfer stage, a Mars Earth communication satellite, and 14 little CubeSats. The total mass of this craft is only 5 tons. To loft my craft into orbit, I built this simple launcher here. Alright, I think I'll shut up and let you guys enjoy the launch now. 
And there you have it, an Earth-Mars communication network built using the power of math. Before you all leave though, I have an important announcement to make. I now have a Patreon. If you'd like to support the channel, you could donate to my Patreon page in the link below. Thanks so much for watching.